everyone, this is Tamara from ShelfAddiction.com, and welcome to episode 76. Today on Book Chat, I'm interviewing audiobook narrator Michelle Bob. All of Michelle's social media links are listed below in the show notes, so if you'd like to reach out to her, you know where to find her. If you're enjoying today's episode, please like and share it. Show your support by rating the podcast and leaving a positive review. The podcast can be found on the Spreaker app, iTunes, Google Play Music, the Stitcher app, and more. If you'd like to comment on something you've heard in today's episode, you can leave a comment below or you can find me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. If you'd like to email in feedback or questions, feel free to reach out to me at info at shelfaddiction.com. Michelle has been narrating audiobooks for the last three years. She's currently working on her 32nd title for ACX slash Audible. Michelle's here to give us a little insight into the world of audiobook narrating, and we'll also get a sneak peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Stay tuned as she shares her passion for audiobooks and her experience as a narrator. Enjoy. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for joining me today. How are you? I am great. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm really excited to talk to your listeners and readers about audiobooks. Oh, I'm excited for that you're here because let me tell you, I love audiobooks. I don't know if you know that or not, but I actually, I love them. So it's so exciting for me to get like a, um, a time to talk with a narrator who does this for a living. It's so awesome. Great. Happy to be here. Yeah. So let's kick things off with, um, tell me how you started narrating. Well, I've just always loved reading aloud. I did a little bit of theater in college, have some experience with uh, speaking in church and things like that, but I love reading fiction and uh, doing all the voices. So I remember that when my kids were little, I would read the Harry Potter books to them and they would always insist that I do all the voices. And I would say, could somebody else read for a while so I can get some knitting done? Or, and they would say, no, no, you have to read it. So, <laughs> but it was, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing the characterizations. Um, and a few years ago, a friend of mine completely out of the blue, and I don't think she had any inkling that I was considering a career change at the time. And she said she was listening to an audiobook. She said that her enjoyment of the book really depended on the narrators. And she just said to me out of the blue, you would be really good at that. And I thought, yes, I would. <laughs> and I just said, I've got to look into this, what's involved. And that was about the time or shortly after ACX came into being. ACX is a large producer of audiobooks uh, for Audible and Amazon. Uh, they're kind of the 900-pound gorilla in terms of people like me being able to get in with really no, uh, I don't have a Shakespearean resume. I'm not a trained speaker. I'm not trained in, I don't have a background in radio or in public speaking, mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like I can do fiction. I can do a normal sounding person and I can do some character voices and things. Uh, but how do I get to try that ACX is where you can go and get your voice to the author's ear or the rights holder's ear, the person who makes the decision about who's going to be uh, producing this audiobook. So that was an interesting thing. I mean, I had to go with finding out, for example, that audiobooks are no longer on CDs. They're no longer on cassette tapes. They're largely uh, produced and just downloaded as uh, MP3s and other forms of you know, stuff you can get on the internet. So you don't have to get a piece of hardware and put it in a you know device. Mm -hmm. So that was a revelation for me and learning what's an MP3. How do you make one? That's the level that I was at. Uh, so downloading the software, which I use uh, audacity, which is a, a program you can download for free. It's available online. And then just practicing with it for hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. and uh, going on ACX where the authors post their, script a short audition script from the book and you read it and upload it and it goes straight to the author and you know i love that i love the egalitarian nature of that that it's, it's really open to anybody who wants to try it and uh it's up to the author it's their opinion it's not uh, authors like that i think the autonomy and the independence of being able to choose it's not all in the publisher's hands uh, who's going to be voicing their characters. So That's very cool. So do any publishers actually use ACX or is it all kind of self-pub in, you know, small press and D-type authors? Yes, yes, publishers do as well. So other ways to find a narrator, you can go on some other online sites. Uh, there's one called Voices123. There's one called Voice Bunny. There, you know, if you look into where voice actors find work, uh, some of them are for audiobooks. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go and find your narrator, and if your narrator uh, uploads the MP3s, then you've got yourself a book. In the case of ACX, you upload it to ACX. You have a contract through ACX, and they're producing the books for Audible that will go on Amazon. Uh, but there are other ways to do that. Very cool. So how do you prepare for an audiobook narration 
Like, how do you work with the authors to kind of hash out how the ca- character should sound and things like that? Well, first of all, I just read through the whole book. And I think if you're a good writer, I get the idea of what this character would sound like. I know when you do a book review, you can just kind of see what this person is like. You can mm-hmm. probably see in your head if this book, this is the question I ask authors all the time. If this book is made into a movie, who plays this character? Mm-hmm. That's what I ask. And then, and I've had them tell me someone that I don't know, and I'll go watch YouTube videos of her. Because it, when I'm in the first few chapters, I may not know whether she's going to turn out to be the murderer or the <laughs> the fairy godmother or whatever. Right. But it's like, okay, you want her to sound a little sinister. There's something around the edges there. She's not as as innocent as she seems or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask him what, what actor or actress would play this person. And I'll try to think of that, have that person in mind. It's not that I'm going to be a recognizable, you know, I'm not going to get sued for uh, impersonating Brad Pitt because I don't think that's going to be recognizable at all. But I think right. it's that sort of character. It's that uh-huh. kind of person that they would play. Some people, I mean, if you think about it, they always play the same sort of person they get typecast maybe you know Mm -hmm. betty white she's always the sweet grandmotherly but has the sort of salty you know ironic sort of thing she comes up with uh if you if you told me johnny depp is playing this character i would say which one the (laughs) willy wonka or the jack sparrow or the edward scissorhands you know which of those types of people are we talking about here um but so that gives me a good idea of the uh characters Really, when you have the narrator voice, which might be a first person or a third person narrator, usually, rarely second, um, they'll get that in the audition script. I would hope that I'm going to be reading some narration and they're going to say, I like your voice or I don't. Sometimes it's, you know, I want someone who sounds older, who sounds uh, younger, who sounds, who does this or that. Uh, tell me which character is doing the narration. You know, is it the older person? Is it the person with the southern accent? You know, how much of, of that? accent or voice am I going to have to do uh, for the narration? So I get all that from the author. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes I'll have to ask them about a particular line. Do you mean for this to sound sarcastic or Mm -hmm. does she really mean that? You know, that kind of thing. So I'll have to check those things. Uh, But I get the book. I read the whole book. I send the author 9 million emails uh, that some of them are things that seem like typos Things that may be dialect, is that what you say out where you write? You know? <laughs> or uh, I had, uh, when I did Linda Kozar's books, which are with a Texas accent, I said, how do you pronounce in Texas the word S-Y-R-U-P, that stuff that you pour on your pancakes? Yeah. I said, is the first syllable of that in Texas, is it pronounced seer or, or sir? sir yeah. and, and she responded, in Texas, there is only one syllable in that word. And it's syrup. Syrup. That's how I say it. Syrup. Syrup. So, yeah. So anyway, those are all the questions that I have to ask before I read. Because if I don't think to ask them, then some really interesting things happen. Uh, One of my best mispronunciations was the first book I ever did by Terry Lee. Uh, It's a book called Saving Gracie. And there was a reference to a basketball player, Shaquille Mm O'Neal, who goes by the nickname S-H-A-Q. And I am not a basketball fan. Oh, no. I pronounced, I didn't think to ask. Uh-huh. I thought it seemed obvious that it would rhyme with Iraq. And I said shock. <laughs> oh, no. And she said, well, you know, this chapter that you just posted is great, except that his name is pronounced Shaq. And I said, oh, come on. It could be either way, right? Some people say oh. Iraq. And some people say Iraq. <laughs> I get that. So I asked a couple of friends, and two out of two of them looked at me like I was an idiot. And I said, okay, I'll go dub it. So, but of course, by asking the questions in advance, I try not to have to do as many dubs. So I ask the questions in advance, then I record, and I do the editing, which takes 9 million years. Mm -hmm. You edit audio, I think, for your Mm -hmm. podcast, so you know that there's mouth noise to take out. There's throat clearing. There's breaths in between. uh, That If I have to stop for a sip of water, I'm going to edit out the swallowing because that's really annoying. Right. Uh, So there's all of that editing. And then I go through and listen to myself with my finger on the text. And I frequently find what I call the reados. So you have the typos, the things that I might have to ask the author about. And then my reados, which are the things like saying, well, I might might or might not realize that I said shock instead of shack or Mm -hmm. (laughs) something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll send those to the author and say, 
does this make a big difference? Do you want me to dub it? So your text says the child sat in her lap and I read the child sat on her lap. Is that okay? You know, uh, if it changes the meaning, it's up to the author to tell me whether to dub that. How important is that? I mean, like, you know, I listen to a lot of audiobooks and I also listen to a, a lot of audiobooks along with my Kindle, right? So are they really nitpicky when it comes to that or do they kind of let it slide if it's... Well, it depends on the author. And I've said a couple of things that I went, eh, doesn't really change the, you know, I mean, sounds okay to me. Yeah. And she'll say, no, this is really important or this is how we say this or this is how I meant it, or, you know, so... Uh, so that's fine. She is the final arbiter of whether I dub it. And I do say she because I've done mostly fiction, and it is almost almost entirely uh, female authors. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that's important for the readers. The other thing is whisper sync, which you're aware of, uh, is something that syncs the video, the uh, audio with the text by voice recognition technology. Mm -hmm. So. My reading has to be 99 plus percent accurate with the text. If mm -hmm. I were to leave out a sentence, that would be a problem. If I were to, oh, something I do quite a few times will show up in the reados that I'll say, the text will say, you can't just barge in here, and I'll read, you just can't barge in here. Again, most of the reados are small, and I only pass on things that, I'm saying to the author, this will not endanger whisper sync. The whisper sync compatibility is what enables you to do what some people call immersion reading. Mm -hmm. Or I've seen you, I've seen, seen you do the um, reviews of uh, read and listen yeah. book reviews. Mm -hmm. So whisper sync enables you to switch back and forth. You're yeah. reading. You're in the middle of chapter three. It's time for your dentist appointment. You put in your earbuds and get in your car and listen until you get to the dentist appointment, and then you're in chapter four. And the text has scrolled to keep up with the audio. I love that. I use that feature almost daily. Um, so I definitely am a fan of people using that feature. So that's, that's really cool how that does it, actually. They've got the one up there, uh, Amazon. <laughs> so yeah. you definitely read Mostly Fiction. Is that by design? Or did you kind of just stumble into Mostly Fiction? That's that's my preference. I mean, on ACX, I can always select which genre I want to audition for, um, and uh, so I can see all of them. I can. Uh, there are things I don't particularly care for, even in fiction. I like a lot of what you might call chick lit. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of cozy mysteries. Um, you know, I get to exclude uh, material that. Okay, if it's got a man's naked torso on the front, I'm just going next. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, okay, so no, none of that for you. <laughs> I can pick that. I do uh, a lot of Christian fiction. Um, I, I like to do stuff that's comedy, but I've done a couple that are kind of psychological suspense, and that's been interesting. Um, I like I like a lot of the authors that I've worked with, and I would do another book for them. And it you know it's got to do with writing style, and basically I'm a reader, and it's fun to do the kind of stuff that I would like to read. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. So when it comes to, you know, series, right? I'm a series reader. I love series. I know a lot of my audience are series readers as well. Um, I noticed that you have quite a few series. Obviously, I think the author and the audience, the listening audience, like to hear the same narrator back again, book after book, if they enjoy the narration. Um, I listened to your snippet of the fourth book in the Darcy and Flora Cozy Mystery Series called Grave Heritage. That came out this year. Yes. And I'd like to play a little snippet for the audience. So we're going to go sure. ahead and listen to a minute. Wear short pants for a while, keep this ointment on it, and change the bandage every day, Doc McCauley said. I slid from his examining table and took a few steps toward the door. Thanks, Doc, I mumbled. I don't know what you put in that shot, but it's good stuff. My leg doesn't hurt at all now. In fact, I've never felt better. The doctor laughed and stopped me with a hand on my shoulder. The door is in the other direction, Darcy, he said. Grant rose from his chair and took my arm. I'll get her home, Doc, he said. Yes, I muttered, blinking as the doctor's face swam into focus. Thank goodness Grant can drive me home. When we listen to that, you can hear that you have a clear Southern accent. Do you know, yes. can you tell me what kind of Southern that is just by the book? 
That is an attempt at, well, they live in Oklahoma. Uh And so that is uh, actually, I did the Linda Kozar books first with a Texas accent. And then someone else cast me to do a Southern accent that was supposed to be South Carolina. And I did about the same accent because that's what I got. Uh, But Darcy and Flora are in Oklahoma. And I started doing that as an impersonation of an acquaintance of mine who's from Oklahoma. Oh, wow. That's kind of cool. So yeah. the next... most, most people, most people I will uh, say, oh, I know someone who talks like this or for some accents I have gone on YouTube and there are a lot of videos that will show you how to do an Australian accent here. Here's the way this vowel sounds. Now say this list of words, you know, mm-hmm. um, and when there's a minor character, I mean, I, I don't do a good British accent for whatever reason. One author thought I did a great Australian accent, uh, which I think should sound a lot like British, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's a character hopefully a minor character who has one of those difficult accents for me I will just about spell it out phonetically but in the case of uh, Darcy and Flora and the Linda Kozar series the narrator has that accent and I got really comfortable to where I've done maybe six books with that accent where the narrator talks like that Wow, that's cool. So when I was listening to some of your other samples, um, I flipped and I went to find something that sounded very different from that one. And I came across the Frankie Shoemaker Campground Mysteries. And Franny Shoemaker. Franny yes, Shoemaker. I love yes. And I listened to Pete and Repeat. And mm-hmm. I'm like, the instantly, you know, I can play a little clip here for everyone, but instantly I... I could tell that it was like night and day narration from the other book, in my opinion. So Mm -hmm. let's go ahead and listen to a minute of that. Virginia was about to close the laptop, but decided to check her sister's account, automatically entering the password. The screen showed 10 or 12 unopened emails, half a dozen ads for online clothing and photo outlets, three forwards of feel-good slogans and pictures from an annoying cousin, two notices from volunteer groups about upcoming events, and one from an unfamiliar personal email address that had just arrived. She clicked on it and glanced over it, then reread it carefully, leaning toward the screen. Dear Val, it said, I can't tell you how much I have missed you since arriving home. What an amazing time we had. My sister has tried to talk me into a cruise for years, and I always thought it sounded stupid. How wrong I was. I just got back from the business trip to Spain that I told you about, and I have to see you again. I have a short layover in Minneapolis on Friday. Can I come by right after lunch? I love you, Richard. Okay, so tell me what kind of accent that was. Uh... That I would call neutral. No, no, let me see. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. And I'm pretty sure it's the part about Virginia and her sister, and she's opening the email. Yes, yes, you're right. Yep. Okay, that's I pretty much the way I talk. So those uh, Franny Shoemaker is all supposed to be upper Midwestern um, Iowa, Wisconsin, and she didn't want the Fargo type accent. She wanted just she said normal Midwesterner. I said I got that. Oh, <laughs> nice. So. Being that, like, for example, both of these are series, how do you keep the voices sounding the same book after book when there's times in between where you're doing other projects? How do you recollect and bring that back so it sounds the same? Well, I can go back and listen to them. I have all those files on my hard drive. But basically, I have a person in mind for each of those people. So in the Franny Shoemaker, I would say Franny Shoemaker is my voice. That's Mm -hmm. the way I'm talking right now. Um, Mickey, her brother-in-law is Buddy Hackett. That's who I was thinking of. Mm. Uh, Jane Ann is a person I know whose name happens to be Jane. And that's who I think of, you know, when I do that voice and I, I picture her, even though it describes Jane Ann physically in the book somewhere and she doesn't look like my friend, but that's the voice I gave her. Yeah. Uh, so I just say, okay, talk like this. Now, when I do Franny, Okay, for example, the the weirder the voice is, the harder it is, or the more of a reach it is for me, the less range I'm going to have in expressing different emotions, you know? This is the funny person. This is the growly person who always sounds angry. It's going to be hard for me to make them sound sweet or gentle or some other, you know? So Franny Shoemaker is me. 
I can do Franny Shoemaker crying. I can do Franny Shoemaker angry. I can do Franny Shoemaker frightened. You know, I can, because mm-hmm. I got a lot of range within my own voice. Larry, her husband, is the lowest voice I can possibly do, and he'll talk about like this. And so he sounds kind of, he's he's going to sound sort of monotone, and he's not a flat or dull person, but I don't, I can't make him sound frightened. How high could his voice go before right. it would start to sound like Michelle again, you right. know? Mm-hmm. Well, that's something, you know, about when narrators have to narrate for men and women and sometimes children is, you know, as a listener, sometimes narrators do it really well and it's believable and sometimes it just sounds wrong. So how do you know, like how deep you can go or other than just knowing your own voice, like how far will you stretch to try to make the men and the children sound different? Yeah, well, and uh, I want to pick your brain about this because you're a listener yeah. and I read on the blogs and Reddit and boards where people comment about audiobooks. How do you think a man should approach, a male narrator should approach doing a woman's voice and how should a female narrator approach doing a man's voice? My approach is that I do not want to make the men sound ridiculous, like mm-hmm. caricatures, unless you're doing, and occasionally there's a character that they did write him to be a ridiculous stupid crook, you know, that kind of thing. He's supposed to sound pretty Mm -hmm. two-dimensional. But in general, for doing Larry, who's supposed to be a real person, I don't want to do what I call the growly monster voice because I don't know any men who really sound like that, you know? So I have a low voice for a woman. I can sing alto to some higher tenor, and if I just lower my voice as much as possible and the other – Main difference, I think, between men's and women's speaking is that women tend to be more articulate. So you can, you know, cue the caveman jokes if you want to. But (laughs) uh, I've heard of speech therapists and uh, people who will advise men who want to sound less effeminate Mm -hmm. to it's more of a grunting. It's more of a soften all of your vowels. But when you pronounce things precisely, you tend to sound more feminine, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can do, and I've done a couple of women's voices that are low, particularly old ladies and uh, that kind of thing, but but you still keep the articulation. Or you can do uh, a man's voice who's higher. Think of a a squeaky man's voice like Don Knotts when he does Barney Fife. That may be for your time. But, uh, (laughs) you know, some, some villains like Voldemort will have a really high sneering evil voice but you can still make him sound like a man you know so i I don't know how to describe that any better than to try to demonstrate it in nine million different ways (laughs) but so so that's my approach is when i hear uh critiques on some of the boards and reviews and things that they'll say this man is doing a woman's voice and he's making her sound really fluty and fruity and i don't know any women who talk that way or who speak that high in fact uh and and doing a man's voice same way it's not all about getting your voice lower so there is some come on he's a gruff old sheriff and he comes in and he says all right what's going on here folks you know that sounds more like a man than if you were to you know be able be able to go lower than i can go so yeah well in my personal opinion listening i find that I, my ears are more accepting to women, you know, lowering their voice or dropping like some of the pronunciation, the exactness. Um, I accept that easier than I accept a man trying to do a woman because sometimes they end up trying to do this falsetto thing and it comes across horribly or, (laughs) you know, like Mm -hmm. you said, it's just too extra, right? Women don't Mm -hmm. generally talk in that sort of way. Um, Mm -hmm. So personally, just listen, I listen to a lot of women, I think more women narrators than men. It's very hard for me to find one where I just am like awed by their ability to do a woman's voice. But there are a few out there. I've got to admit a couple, you know, here and there, but I definitely think it's easier for women. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the main thing about reading a book, and I've had a couple of authors who even request look, don't do special voices, just read it as you, because you realize, of course, I'm reading the book where it's going to say, blah, 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 Franny said, blah, 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 Larry replied. If I didn't do any voices, you would figure that out. And so some of them prefer that. And I get what they're saying is when you get too over the top with your characterizations, you know, we say you don't want to be cartoonish, uh, or I would say you don't want your 
voice, your portrayal to be distracting. Okay. Uh, if people are like worried about the narrator's, you know, mental health or whatever, mm -hmm. that it's, they can't, they, it takes them out of the story is the thing you worry about. But you know what though, without, you know, some inflections of voice or change, you know, just any kind of change to differentiate the different characters, it kind of just sounds like you're reading the book instead of narrating. So I don't know. I personally like to hear some differences <laughs> in the voices. Uh, I can't speak for others, obviously, but I think that's my preference. It doesn't have to be dramatic like we were talking about earlier where, you know, you have this really low monster voice, as you say it, or, you know, childlike voice in other senses. But I don't know, just flat reading a book. I kind of zone out on that a little bit. I'm surprised authors ask for that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously, that's my the fun of it for me is doing the voices and sort of trying to embody the characters. But I don't want it to be. Uh, I've heard it said that if you're listening to a narrator and you're saying to yourself, that's a really good narrator, then there's something wrong. It should be, wow, I just got lost in the story and I yeah. thought that was the character, you know? Yeah. Now, I guess that's the difference between just an average listener and someone that listens with a critical ear, because I kind of do both, right? When you narrate an audio book, you, you're reading, you're listening for the enjoyment, but you also do have to critique the narration. So you are listening for other things that maybe regular readers aren't listening for. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I hope so. And I don't get a lot of, I mean, I, I guess if the technical quality is adequate in terms of your editing, your background noise, uh, that kind of thing. I don't get a lot of critiques uh, from the average listeners that comment on the audio quality. They more, they're more into the drama of it and how you personified these characters and how you read the, you know, the more emotional passages or something like that uh, more so than the actual, the audio quality. So let's switch a little to something a little bit more fun. So tell me who are a few of your favorite narrators to listen to? Oh, definitely Jim Dale, who narrated the Harry Potter series. Oh, he always I, comes up every time I talk about audiobooks. Everyone loves him. <laughs> love those. Well, I love the books, so yeah. I love listening to probably anyone read them. But I've listened to him. I've listened to a little bit of Stephen Fry. I guess I, I heard Jim Dale first, and I just, he is those characters for me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Do you have a okay. favorite woman narrator? Um. Maybe Cassandra Campbell, and it's just I, I listen to her a lot, and I try to emulate her a lot. Um, she does a lot of the types of books that I would like to do, so trying to get into those genres. Is... Very cool. So what are your favorites? Like, give me one or two of the books that you enjoyed narrating the most, where you think you gave your best performances. Uh, I love the Linda Kozar series. It's funny. It's just kind of uh, fluffy, and I mean that in a good way. Mm -hmm. I love cozy mysteries. Um, you know, I, I'm not a real hardcore police procedural type uh, fan, but the ones that are funny and the ones that are more getting into the relationships and the wackiness of the characters, in addition to hopefully having a real mystery that holds together and makes sense, but uh, really the character development, I get into that. I loved uh, Cupidity by Patricia Wood. Cupidity, a novel. It's where the main character is a 23-year-old waitress. She's kind of a female Forrest Gump type character. And she gets an African email telling her that she's inherited $5 million. <laughs> and and her small town family and friends and her whole dysfunctional world uh, comes together to try to help her collect this windfall. And it's a very funny and a heartwarming book and some really funny characters and good writing Oh, wow. Oh, goodness. I hope uh, she another, learns before she sends the money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, another big favorite. Uh, so I, I like a lot of funny books, and I like the heartwarming and the happy ending. Yeah. Uh, another couple of favorites are by Melinda Clayton. Uh, one of them is called Making Amends, and that is about a 50-year-old uh, um, recovering addict, uh, Tabby Clark, who 30 years ago gave birth to twins, and one of them at the age of five was kidnapped by their estranged father. Hmm. So this is already set up to be a weird, dysfunctional tearjerker. Mm -hmm. And he's not been heard from since. Now, 30 years later, in Chapter 1, he resurfaces on the morning news. Uh, he's been arrested and accused of killing the father. Mm. Wow. So you can, that book's going to go in all kinds of directions. And it's really very... Uh, emotional ups and downs and the author in that case is a former psychoanalyst and she writes I think very good fiction about people dealing with their past and how they either excuse and rationalize their actions or over, are overly critical in blaming themselves or, or how they take responsibility or deal with it so mm -hmm. that's really good 
Oh, wow. That sounds good. Okay. So do you have any advice for those that would like to get into narrating, you know, as a professional, um, what, what advice would you give them? Well, with ACX available, I think just do it is my main advice. Uh, there are a lot of other sites where you can try it. ACX has been, I mean, I can see myself still getting better. It has been a great uh, opportunity for me to get some work, do some books, uh, keep developing in different directions, uh, getting, you know, in terms of the, the drama, the characters that I select, getting better in terms of the editing, the technical quality. I'm still learning about it. Um, so not to, you know, spend too much time thinking about it. You do some reading, some research, figure out how to set up your home studio and so on. Uh, and then just try it. Awesome. So let's talk a tad about the money, like for Audible, the royalties versus, you know, per finished hour. Cause I know people who are interested in narration probably want to know a little bit about that. So can you share a little bit? Yeah, so when you do a project on ACX, you can uh, you post. I post a profile on ACX, then the authors can shop, or if they're looking for narrators, you can do a southern accent or narrator, female narrators, whatever. Um, and on my profile, I can list a per finished hour rate. Per finished hour rate for narration means how much am I going to get paid for every hour of finished audio. If it's a nine-hour book and I'm getting $100 per finished hour, it'll be $900 to do the whole project. Simple. Um, royalties is where I would get a percentage of the sales of the book, and that's for a seven-year contract is what they do on ACX. Uh, standard is to get 20% of the uh, royalties for the seven years. So when I'm looking at a book, and this is really hard to figure out how much you're going to make. I mean, unless you take a per-finished hour, but if you take royalties – uh, I mean, I would love to narrate a Harry Potter book for royalties. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if I spend a month and a half on your book and it sells five copies in the next year, well, then that was not such a good deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that, that's been another learning process for me. Uh, and I'm fortunate that this is a second career and it's not a real high pressure thing as far as the money. So I've just had a lot of fun uh, learning about that. But I'm looking at, you know, as I try to get with bigger authors, bigger projects, and maybe become a better judge of not just the quality of the writing, because all I can read is the audition script before I say I'm willing to do this book, right. um, but the, the quality, the background, the platform of the author, whether they are on Facebook, what, they, what their Amazon profile looks like. Uh, I can't see what their sales of their previous book have been, but I can see how many reviews. It's like, well, you've got 500 reviews on that book. That sold a lot, you know. Right. Um, if it's only got three reviews, it may have sold millions, but, boy, yeah, <laughs> not right. many people write reviews. So, um, so that's what I'm trying to assess before I sign on. Oh, that's that's some good information. You guys listen to Michelle. <laughs> She's got good stuff. Okay, so I guess that's about it for today. Why don't you tell everyone if they like want to get in contact with you as far as narrating their book, how can they find you online? Uh, if you go to acx.com and you can sign on if you're an author uh, and it says search for narrators, uh, you can actually search by name for Michelle Babb. Or like I said, that's where people would search based on what accent or, or gender that they want. Um, I'm on uh, Goodreads. I have an author profile on Goodreads as Michelle Babb. Uh, and I hope you're going to post a link here on your blog or on your uh, podcast somewhere to all of my projects um, on uh, Audible. Yes, there and, will be an Audible link that you guys can click in the show notes. So, yes, indeed. Yeah, that's where your readers and listeners can go. Uh, and you can actually listen to sample audio, read the little blurb for each book. Oh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off for this episode? That is about it. Um, you guys, if you have questions for Michelle, please leave them below. Uh, and she'll reply back to you directly or tweet at her on Twitter. Are you on Twitter, Michelle? I am on Twitter. And on Twitter, my handle is face for audio F-A-C-E, numeral 4, A-U-D-I-O. Awesome. So you guys know how to find her, and she'll be answering any questions that are posted on the video. And that is all. So it has been a pleasure. Thank you for talking with me today. Great. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you for tuning in and downloading today's episode. If you are enjoying the book chat episodes and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. First, you can head on over to iTunes and give a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. You can follow the Shelf Addiction podcast on Spreaker, the only place where you can listen live and get broadcast notifications so that you never miss a live episode. Most importantly, you can share the podcast with friends and family that love books and audiobooks. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading.